All right. Barb, can you take it away? I'm going to unmute you. Okay. Can you hear me? Hi, everybody. It is so good to be back with Second Sunday Poetry Series. Um, just so good to see so many uh, familiar faces. Um, I want to thank Sean for, well, for taking over the reins of SSPS um, and also for inviting me back to read. I also want to thank Marin Poetry Center for co-hosting this reading. Um, I'm very happy to be reading with my Sunday posse, uh, Ken, Janet, Amanda, and you, Sean, and in memory of Susan. I'm going to read um, six pieces from an upcoming collection. And uh, the first one is called Looking for Peace. Every day a woman plays piano near an open window and I listen from the front courtyard in my afternoon reading chair. Watch hummingbirds soar and dive with perfect aim into the long necks of foxglove and lupin. I'm taking in the stillness that clings to the undersides of leaves, the aliveness of other creatures. Bees frenzy the lavender, monarchs hover in front of me until I really see them. This one is called Rain. Through the screened glass door, I watch rain drip from the tip of a fern leaf onto the dahlia below, mouth wide open. I'm taken back to our voluptuous room. I draw us a bath, drop my clothes in a curvy path. Later, we'd sleep hard, woven, warm. I'm lost now in the water quivering in rivulets lost in the rhythm of the rain on the roof. I stoke the walnut fire while outside bean tendrils reach and cling to their trellises and tomatoes wrap themselves around their cages. I need a sip of water. <laughs> This is called, I'll be the bird. Coasting now in the lift and drift near sunlight, gliding soundless on the wind's billowy offering. I long to make it to the water's sandy edge, fluffed feathers setting down in foam. I scan the vastness for direction and find only horizon. I float weightless between sky and sea. I'll be the bird who carries a twig in my mouth to drop onto the water below to rest upon when currents still and night falls and my wings tire. Delirious. A couple of these are in honor of Valentine's Day. We lay delirious, limbs drunk and tangled, air thick with us. It was like that every time, but more. We opened our throats to the fire. We swallowed each other whole. We were those burning orange embers. For years, I stayed close to the heat, pushed myself hard up against it, like a junkie curled around a lit can, craving your flame to fill me. This is called Brian Eno and the Buddha. And this was a Pushcart Prize nominated uh, poem. I blast Brian Eno when I wake. An ending, a scent, vibrates and hums in my torso and limbs, emanates up through the skylight and back down, sun spilling onto the opal tile floor. It's Sunday and this is my church. I think about the man here in Oakland who, tired of waking to junk dumped in his yard, set out a statue of the Buddha. Soon, no more trash. 
People lined up to sweep and to pray. They took care of the Buddha, built an altar, brought the man more food than his family could eat. And I think he could have sat there out, he could have sat out there all night with a shotgun waiting. But no, with this one peaceful gesture, he sparked kindness instead of hatred, humanity over retaliation, ascension. These notes, these chords, these tones. They rip my whole heart open, empty it into this room. Excuse me. And I'm going to finish with one that is um, as yet untitled. Maybe when I figure out what it's about, I'll be able to name it. <laughs> um, okay, untitled. Bone, blood, limbs, fingers, scar tissue, and musculature. The olfactory, the tactile, all the ways we hand ourselves over, piecemeal. Words that stick, ones that roll off, how her fire finds something inside you and lights it. Stories we've been told and those we believe, victim, villain, hero, human. Fears jammed into jars and stacked tall, Memories like crushed glass. Deeply worn grooves that take us around. Aching, longing, blissful, sated. How her hair falls over you. Breath on your neck. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barb. Those are just Thank gorgeous. Thank you, Sean. Just gorgeous. So I'm going to mute you, and uh, the next reader we have today is Janet Jennings. Okay, um, let's see, Janet, are you ready? I'm going to, if I can find you, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Janet. Okay, there we are. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you, Barb, for your poems of delight and also for being the founder of this really lovely poetry series. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. And um, I'm really delighted to be reading with these wonderful poets who I've known and worked with for years and who have made me a better poet. And I wanna thank Sean for putting this reading together to honor the life and the spirit of Susan Bonetto, who was a bright light in the world. Um, I am going to begin with a poem that summons a muse. Pan at the back door. Some call him Lord of wild places, some goat god, trickster, all in betweens but I call and he finds his way to my door. Slouched hat, black boots, guitar, or sometimes offering spearmint and blackberries. La Lumiere is what I want. He brings a different fire. His sly whispers unfinish me. Furred, long fingered, his strangeness, and I follow into the tall grass Larkspur, lupin, a green time filled with spillage and blur. He comes loosening, coaxing rhymes from a restless moon, ruinous and beautiful, trailing X's, stems and leaves. He does not come to stay. So, we're so close to Valentine's Day and I realized I really don't write love poems, which someday I hope to rectify. But when I told Sean of my dilemma, her response was chocolate. What is Valentine's Day without chocolate? And that is actually something I do write about. My family's been uh, making chocolate for four generations, starting with my great grandfather who worked at Ambrosia Chocolate in Milwaukee. And then my grandfather and his two brothers started their own factory in Chicago in 1939. My father followed them into the business 
And so chocolate has always been a part of my life and its smell for me is like Proust's Madeline. This is called chocolate in the garden. I keep a pot of chocolate cosmos tucked in the garden like a handwritten note. Velvety brown petals unfold in the July sun, giving off deep cocoa, the smell of baking brownies. And back I go to childhood and we'll met. Dad pulled up in a green Chevy station wagon, loaded to the roof with heavy shell after the beans were roasted, cracked, and winnowed at the factory. He hauled the bags out one by one, stagging, st stacking them into a fort on the front lawn. Walls eight thick bags high, open to the summer sky. Neighbor kids came running. Nobody had fences then. Skitty bodies climbed everywhere. Pungent, chocolatey aromas released from rough burlap as we scrambled to the top. Days later, Dad pulled down the fort, slid open the bags, and dragged brittle brown shell across the yard, mulching nitrogen into hedges and grass. All summer, the outside smell of chocolate. This next poem was written for a wonderful man named Paolo Blondino, who worked at the factory. That's where I got to know him, the chocolate factory. There are two lines of Italian in this poem and they are from uh, Tos sorry, Puccini's opera, Tosca. And I apologize ahead of time for my attempt at an Italian accent. For Paolo, on the molding line. He tapped the metal molds with a knowing force and rhythm to unhouse chocolate, packed it bar by bar in paper sleeves, loaded it in jumbos. He sang all day over the noise of forklifts, trucks, the radio, din of machinery. I worked summers during college on the next line over packing chocolate drops. You are young, he'd say, you are beautiful. Why you want to work here? When he was a boy in Sicily, evergreen groves of carob fed his family during the war. It's fruit, the only sweetness in those years. All the Italians at the plant had gardens grew tomatoes they ate at lunch hour with a little salt. In Italy, we work to live. In United States, we live to work, he'd tell me, shaking his head. He knew his craft, adjusted the tempering tubes, flow of chocolate, speed through the cooling tunnel. He knew arias by Donizetti and Puccini, a Lucevan le stelle, and the stars were shining. He sang himself to somewhere else, to Sicily, sun on his face, a full and breaking heart. 35 years in the same spot, in a plant without windows, he soared. E non ho amato mai tanto la vita, never. Have I loved life so much? This last poem was written for the British actress, Diana Rigg, who passed away in 2020. I first saw her on a witty TV spy show called The Avengers that played in the 60s. He a badass Mrs. Emma Peel. And I'd like to dedicate this poem to Susan, another intrepid woman. We miss you, Mrs. Peel. We practiced your judo kicks in the mirror, studied devotedly 
your fencing flourishes, the playful swing of your hair, that skin tight leather cat suit. You could shoot off a champagne court from across the room. Your partner steed holding the frothing bottle with a look we couldn't decode. Our mothers in their everyday dresses and flat heeled shoes sat upstairs sipping coffee in a beige tiled kitchen. While my best friend and I clambered down to the basement to switch on the latest episode of Flair and Innuendo, we watched you with your sculpted cheekbones and effortless cool, toss villains over your shoulder with a plum. A woman complete in herself, better than James Bond with his gadgets and martinis. You showed us what we hadn't known we wanted. Sovereignty, a fearless swagger, a fast car racing out of town toward a future larger than a house in the suburbs with a yard, larger even than Chicago with its lakeshore towers and glittering lights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. I'm stepping in momentarily for Sean to once again give a round of applause to Janet and introduce Sean Killingsworth, our intrepid host, who will also be reading tonight, today. Ah, and I've managed to unmute myself. Thanks, Amanda. <laughs> so I'm just gonna read a few poems today um, and I'm gonna start with the spring. So this poem is called April Blossoms and there's a French phrase in it, qui si frotte si pique which means if you rub against it, you'll get pricked, which is sort of the same thing as, you know, if you play with fire, you're gonna get burned. Uh, this poem is about thistles. Consider an uninviting bouquet, purple flower as a crown, brittle greens and spider spiked. Si frotte si pique. Few tiny drops of nectar, prickles abound. Milk thistle, Lorraine and her ladies, Carduus, Circium and Onoportum, underskirts like blanched and wilted stars, prized by goldfinches singing dinner theater, their melody heard two fields below, a feast. Um, my next one's a little bit longer, it's called Isobar, which is a meteorological meteorological term, uh, which I encourage you all to look up. This was one I didn't know uh, until my husband introduced it to me. And it's, it's basically sort of a math term where you can uh, make different measurements become comparable. So Isobar, she's map making, measuring distances, ink stained and coffee sick. Their root, a web of errors and serendipity. Potholed with grace and worry. Uprooting and rerooting. OAK, PDX, JFK, LOG, SFO. Flights fueled by fear. Dragging hope against the lift. The air against them hot and wet. A storm of searching for the American dream. His internal barometer as wild as her geography. Pressure rising or dropping with each filed memory, each unforeseen detour, the sun heralded by a grin. He smooths the wrinkles out of packing paper, just unwound from stems of lamps, uncrumpled from inside bowls and cups. He grips in dry hands, the pages that legitimize a life, certifications of birth, death, illness, debt, and he sighs a hurricane, a song. The papers crinkle, a sparrow thuds the glass. Sorry. <laughs> a sparrow thuds glass, a pane of brittle wings. Hopping, hopping, the woman runs to the window. Birds hear their brother fall, 
dissolve from the nest in a fluster of alarm. They are guided by charts of their own design. No gods look upon them with pity. No shaman leads them. They make a life by compass, by desire. A man and a woman afloat in this green hush, ex-Boston, ex-Brooklyn. Now every day, a cool rayed bay sunset. Gold hills shine for anyone. Countless leaves, live oak, manzanita, poppy, rose. They plant their feet. Um, this is the second to last poem I'll read, and I sort of um, invented my own mythology here. Uh, it's called Cassiopeia and Orion, and it was inspired by, by summer nights lying on this golf course on the East Coast, just watching the stars revolve over my head. And I just sort of invented a little uh, love story for myself. She waits for him all summer slowly spreading herself wide across the hot sky, revolving a hot zigzag till October. She glitters lazily above him, wordless, anticipating his entrance from the rim of the world. Fall begins to cool the air, condensing humidity, and the world starts to tilt for her. On glassy evenings, three diamonds in his belt shoot beams of fire. She waits for him to rise up, her patience, her excitement, spun out in the dark, a web of stars to catch him. And my last poem is called In California, which, uh, was sort of inspired by a friend of mine who also moved here from the East Coast. And we both were just in disbelief at how everything around here is so green and flourishing and, you know, gorgeous. And, uh, and so this is for Sarah. Calla lilies just grow right out of the dirt. Viridian hummingbirds astonish. This heart so tiny and fragile one drop of vinegar could dissolve it. I wake in springtime, twigs tap glass to draw me out, feathers reckless, sun-drunk warblers loop the loops. I didn't think that a balm could break me, open again. Heat spangles gold hills, songs hurtling through morning like victory banners. And that's, that's it for me. Thank you. And um, I'm going to turn it over now to our next reader who, let's see, is Amanda Moore, who is actually the person who invited me to join this reading group. So thank you, Amanda, because it's been really one of the joys of the last several years to get such great feedback from such wonderful poets. Um, and I'm going to... Hi. Thank you so much, Sean. And thank you to Ken and Barb and Janet and you, Sean, for letting me be here. I think it's only fair to say I am an erstwhile member of your glorious reading group, which I um, have not attended very much during Zoom. Um, and I miss you all. So it's been really lovely to see you. So thank you for still counting me as one of yours and for inviting me to be here to honor Susan who I really loved very dearly. Um, like Janet, I don't have very many love poems or rather the love poems that I have are about the complications of love. Uh, but I did dig one up, which perhaps actually will um, also illustrate how much I'm hurting without this lovely group of readers for my poems. This is a newer poem, perhaps in need of some editing, but I thought I'd read it in the spirit of Valentine's Day. Uh, when he says he wants to paint, the old car green. I wonder what he means. Beach glass or underside of leaf, lizard toe, M&M, &M, shamrock in shadow, peridot set 
in an antique ring. Which shade, which blade of grass? This one in sun, that one in the sprinkler's stream, are soft and short, a golf course, long and strong, tangled in sand on shore, stem of iris, spidery carrot leaf, fern, or the sheared jewel face of a wave. We call it the green room deep inside, algae bottom of an inland lake. He says, just green. And I think he must mean the hulk hued walls in the dining room of our first house, where our baby's first food was avocado and we played on a frayed mint rug, could smell tomato plants through the window screens all August, wore that green scent on our hands after we picked and pruned, petrichor and lightning, attar of herb, hint of fertilizer, whiff of aftershave in the bathroom just after dawn, green like his blonde hair in chlorine, army fatigue, so many empty beer bottles, jealousy, cat eye, alligator skin, parrot feather, and the chameleon who can be all greens, kiwi flesh, pea, weed and bramble, or maybe just his faded old t-shirt, emblazoned, Ithaca is gorgeous, which he once first left crumpled on my dorm room floor. There are other kinds of love, I suppose. Um, so I'm going to read a poem that takes its title from a Johnny Cash lyric. It's called Love, A Burnin' Thing. And I actually do know this was written. It's um, from a time when I still was in the writing group and Ken gave me wonderful feedback. I still have the notes on it. So this is Love, A Burnin' Thing. My daughter is giving up on words, at least with me. She slams the door, berates me with silence. I drop the needle on the record player, hear Johnny Cash sing Ring of Fire and fall into that moment, labor, one of the last times an utterance adequately prepared me for anything. How apt the phrase, how perfectly rendered, how I felt Every centimeter ignited my expansion, a perfect burning circle, her soft skull crowned in flare and flame. Yes, the ring I slowly pushed her through toward oxygen to kindle her breath. Oh, how she wailed then, and we clung to one another, all my knowledge suddenly extinguished as I listened to the certainty of her voice knowing how I'd falter, she was naming herself. I wanna read a poem in honor of Susan. One of the things I most loved about her um, was the way she embraced life and new experience. She learned to kayak, she learned to ski, all in the time that I met her. And I actually was looking through some old emails where she was talking to me about the first time she managed to ski down granite. She, um, and I wanted to read this poem for her. It's called Learning to Surf. Okay, ocean, I have forsaken the glittering blue eye of lake to play at the lip of your vast frothy mouth. I have memorized your comings and goings, the tide charts and the swell I have taken you into me by the gallon, let you pin me beneath your surface, and I have been grateful for the seals beside me, infinity in the distance, the promise of pleasure. I have tried to walk lightly over sand crabs and muck. I have learned not to turn away. Let me stand on your shoulders, drop into you and carve my own hard line. I have been patient. Show me what to do with my failures. And I have just two more to share. Um, one is a poem that deals with um, an unfortunate thing that, uh, that 
Susan and I had in common, which is we were both ill at a time. And that was often something that we talked about. And this is a poem that also deals with bees, which is a theme in my first book. This is a poem called Collapse. And I'm thinking of Meryl right now, because I know you're out there and I know you don't like when people read not from the screen and make good eye contact, but I'm still so excited to have a book to read from that I'm just gonna do this one more. Collapse. What do bees want is a question I've never asked myself or any expert. I know they need to gather pollen and nectar, need water and shelter, though they can make their own of any hollow place. But as to want, who can say? I say I need to take my vitamins, apply sunscreen, eat greens and exercise, want self-care, something I deserve for what I do not know. Our bodies are built to decay. I opened the hive only as often as I was told to check brood, the health of the queen. I did not know what I was looking for, but trusted diligence would keep us from disaster. They wanted me out of their way. So I closed it all up, left them to their own desires. And the last poem I'm going to read is about how those days where everything feels weighted with meaning. Everything is a sign today. Feather in the grass, stippled and striped. Hawk, I think. And then a man blocking the sidewalk, child on his back, both of them pointing binoculars toward the treetop where I know a great horned owl nests, though I've never seen it. All these birds, creatures I might never have known had I not spent my childhood filling her feeders, naming each genus from the perch at her kitchen table. A falcon swoops down beside me on the path, gripping some rodent in its talons, twisting the body to kill like the time a heron a few feet from our picnic blanket plucked a whole mouse from its burrow and swept away. She had been delighted, said we too should grab something special of our own that day. Turning toward home, I bend to collect a wrinkled postcard at the curb, an advertisement for the Monet exhibit. How I loved those paintings when I was younger, all of them nearly the same. Haystack, haystack, haystack. The only difference, the season and time of day, which is to say they are like this grief all these months later, all the same, but for the light. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. That was just beautiful. So I, I have to say that I have, I feel very lucky that I've been able to hear so many of these poems before. Um, and I feel like I know them really well and, and listening to them evolve over time and, um, and actually being able to see them in performance now is so, it's so exciting and gratifying. So thank all of you. Thank you, Amanda and Janet and Barb and, and Ken who will read next. This has just been honestly, one of the best readings I think we've ever done and um, I, you know and so personally gratifying to me and I'm glad everybody has come to attend and to listen and so thank you to everybody who's here and uh, and that's all from me so Ken please take it away thanks uh, can you hear me okay or uh, okay sounds good um so I want to start by saying um, that I'm so, so grateful and, and overwhelmed really that the poetry group I've loved being a part of for many years now, um, uh, which as you've heard, we've come to call the posse and which has been an amazing source of inspiration and support and which as you've um, also heard writes poems of intelligence and wonder um, has decided to honor uh, my partner Susan and me uh, in this way. So thank you for that. And thanks everyone for coming. I'm gonna read three of my own poems about Susan. 
the first two written while she was battling cancer and the third um, written after she passed. Um, I hope they speak adequately to our love as well as her courage and, and her ongoing presence. There aren't many silver linings to the pandemic, but one might be that because humans are going out a bit less, animals are getting around a bit more. Uh, for example, penguins have been seen on the streets of Chicago um, and uh, the famed uh, parrots of Telegraph Hill from the conure species have been seen more frequently in other parts of San Francisco. Uh, this poem is called When the Parrots Come. Two conures, South Americans, bagged at birth, slipped their gilded cage here mid-90s, started a flock, numbering hundreds now, eschewing the native flora, the laurel, the live oak, whose acorns the ohlone ground to meal. They flit instead on saucer, magnolia, date palms, power lines, all tangled over Telegraph Hill. 2020, fighting tumors, not asking on which side of her body's borders they were born or fed. Susan sees a pair of them, the parrots, testing our fire escape, a sixth floor rental miles west. They perch an hour, then zip off with a greening throng. Hoping they'll return, she puts out cashews, which is what she has. I say, there's a reason why they chose our railing. Scouts, maybe, lovers stealing a moment, the virus, the warming, and, and cashews could bring gulls. So just leave things as they are. What drew them might draw them again. Susan from the Midwest keeps on with the cashews, having taken in red crowns, indigo eyes, opalescent beaks. Mostly, she says, they sat and looked away. Sometimes though, they nuzzled, danced, hung upside down. From back east, I never see them. We welcome the new year, everyone does. A week later, she says, they came back for a spell, the parrots. I say, no cashews this time, sweetheart. She says, no, no. Of course not. The next poem, which appears in my book, Borrowed Light, is about one of the cancer treatments uh, Susan took on, um, an autologous stem cell transplant, which is effectively a bone marrow transplant that you get from yourself. Uh, this piece begins with a reference to Ponce de Leon, who's uh, the Spanish conquistador um, who, who went searching for the fountain of youth. It's called The Scientist. Ponce was on to something, the magic of youth. Though South Florida, it turns out not the place to search. My love, whom the world needs more than it needs me, needs a bone marrow transplant. The collection of stem cells from her blood for reintroduction after extreme chemo. They are looking for the youngest cells, the uncorrupted. But on Tuesday, her count of these per the hemocytometer is six. Too low to even start the process. 25, they say, is the goal. 40 would be fabulous. They will search again Wednesday. A Filipino nurse named Teo tells her as she leaves that the young cells will come out of hiding if someone rubs the arches of her feet, which someone will be me that evening. After I researched the concept like the scientist I am, discovering it to be ridiculous, even by internet standards, where endorsed stimulants include sweet potatoes and weightlifting, but nothing remotely podiatric. Still, I do like her feet. 
Midwestern, optimistic, true. We start out a bit confused. Did he mean rug or massage? Top, side, bottom? I show her a plastic card correlating regions of the foot sole to internal organs that a co-ed turned shaman gave me in the 60s after we shared an interesting night. My love is not convinced. Though while pressing and squeezing for a full 40 minutes, I can't resist some attention to the base of her pinky toes, which apparently commune with her earlobes. She asks if chatting would break my concentration. Wednesday morning, the only number that means something isn't the Dow or how many runs the Giants scored. It's 79. Who knew that at my age, I could do anything to interest the young? Who knew how ready I had become to abandon science and play the goddamn Pied Piper? I see all those bright cells texting each other as they leave the comfort of the marrow for what my fingers have promised will be the role of their lives. Um, and this last poem written more recently is called Turquoise. When a poet friend asked if you left a scarf I could part with, said she would wear it on our walk to drought-worn Abbott's Lagoon. I brought her your tasseled merino, sharing with one still making words, a cloth last worn only weeks before by you, whose stories had all been told. November light sprayed the scarf's blue across an unspoken shoreline. And memory took on the affection of living in the company of a color pressed palms turn unseen. The color a dark ages Frenchman coined turquoise, as if it were a lady in Constantinople whose eyes would guide him home. This color clung to the loosened wing of a beetle on its back, peaked from the lining of my jacket, spangled a heron's beak, graced the buzz cut of a black girl jogging past, kissed the hem of the water where water used to be. Um, Susan was among many other things, a story writer, starting with tales of her time in Fiji. She kept writing until she passed, including a very moving account, which um, Amanda kind of mentioned uh, called Granite Chief, uh, published online in Change 7 magazine. It's a story about second times. The second time she tried to ski a black diamond run, her second bout with lymphoma and her second great love. Uh, she writes about going with me to ski in Tahoe and taking me to Fiji. Uh, uh, the, and I'm quoting her, place in this world where my heart was full before my optimism broke into shards, before I lost my husband, my first love to a lengthy illness while our teenage son struggled through a brain tumor, before Ken appeared and proved that second love is a miracle in itself. So we'd like Susan to have the last word today with some um, excerpts uh, from one of the Fiji stories in her book, Living Barefoot. And again, I'm, I'll be quoting her. Our story begins on Leluvia, the little island where we actually lived barefoot. I have not yet found a social or economic paradise in this world, but Leluvia is a paradise for those who love warm weather and tropical seas. This island almost doesn't exist. Its place in the world has
has only just been put onto an ocean chart. One of more than 300 islands that comprise the country of Fiji, it ranks among the smallest inhabited islands on earth, five blocks long by one block wide. On the Western side, there is a soft sandy beach. The rest is thick green, tropical trees and bush. The sea is postcard aquamarine fanning out to deeper blue waters. In 1987, the local chief or Ratu and his unskilled crew built simply, slowly, and with little capital investment, several double occupancy bures, Fijian style huts made of thatch, along with five outhouses, a kitchen, a covered eating area, and a tiny shop for soda, beer, cigarettes, and cookies. Leluvia became not the rich and famous idea of holiday, but a stopover for the budget backpacker. By mid-June, we, with only five tools, hammer, saw, shovel, level, tape measure, had built our one-room bungalow and moved in. Relatively speaking, it was the only palace on the island, though by American standards, it was a 450 foot fishing cabin with two doors and five windows, a steady breeze, a view of the sea. We had no running water, electricity, shower or toilet. We washed ourselves in the guest showers and shared the outhouses. For light each night, we used a benzene lantern. We washed our dishes without soap in the ocean using sand to scour the pots. We placed large barrels at two exterior corners of the house and caught rainwater as it fell from the gutters. On days of torrential downpour, we stood directly under the gutters and had the most wonderful fresh showers and shampoos imaginable. We ate mangoes standing in the rain, so the juices simply washed from our hands as we ate them. So thanks everyone for coming and for listening and I'll, I'll give it back to Sean. Thank you so much, Ken. That was so lovely and moving. Thank you for reading Susan's words as well as your own poems. I am so sorry and I'm so grateful to you for being here and allowing us to honor her. Thank you. Barb and Janet and Amanda. Um, I think that we all love Ken and um, just we're glad that we have had this opportunity to show that to you. So I think we're going to wrap it up today and thank everybody for coming. Um, we had a peak of 36 attendees today, which is pretty great. Um, I'm very grateful to all of you for eschewing football and choosing literature instead. It's good for your brain. It's good for your soul. Um, you'll definitely get into heaven. So keep coming back. Um, we have another reading uh, on the second Sunday of next month as well. Shockingly enough, uh, you would never have figured that out from the name of this series. But uh, I, I guarantee you, if you come here every second Sunday, there will be poems. So... I hope to see all of you again. Thank you all. Uh, if you look on the Second Sunday website in a few days, I'll be posting the recording. So anyone who missed it can access it and you can share it with all your friends, relatives, um, coworkers, <laughs> and all the people who missed out because they chose to watch a bunch of grown men run around in tight pants. So thanks all and we will see you next time. Take care and happy Valentine's Day. <laughs>